That is, I picked up the important structures in the human brain and I mentioned which are the arterial supplies of those. So let's quickly go over there. Medulla. Branches from the vertebral artery, the PIC, the pons, from the basal artery, midbrain, PCAs, cerebellum, all the CAs, PICA, PICA, SC, thalamus, anterior thalamoporphyry, anterior carotid, from internal carotid, posterior thalamoporphyry, posterior carotid, from PC. Please note the word thalamoporphyry. It should ring a bell by now. They produce end arteries. They can produce lacunar parts. When you see the word perforating, it should bring up that. Corpus straight, anterolateral central arteries from MCA, anteromedial central arteries from ACA. Corpus callosum, anterior forfeit by ACA, posterior forfeit by ACA, in a PCA. Next, hippocampus, hippocampal artery from PCA as well as choroidal branches from IC and PCA. Chorad plexus the lateral ventricle. I think I've mentioned this many times. Chorad plexus the third ventricle, I've mentioned many times. Chorad plexus the fourth ventricle, I've mentioned many times. And finally, internal capsule. Supermuscular, anterior limb, ACA. Genome and posterior limb, MCA. I mean, these are so much must know that I mean, I cannot emphasize enough. Now let's come to the next subtopic, this chapter. Circle of Willis, which everybody is aware of, but there are many small, small points integrated within the circle of Willis. So let's take a, say a few words about the circle of Willis. Location. It is located here, where my index finger is pointed. It is located in the interpiracular fossa of the brain, at the base of the brain. It is in the cistern, an interpinacular cistern, or it is also referred to as a crural cistern. I hope everybody is clear in their mind what the meaning of the word cistern is. Yes? It is an enlarged southern type space. The fire is surrounding the brain, and the CSF is filling the space between the fire. Okay. So the circle of Willis basically is a communication between the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. Anterior circulation, as I told you, is the interrotted system, and the posterior circulation is the vertebral basal system. Which are the participants of the circle of Willis? A little bit of the basal arc, the two BCAs, the ACA, a little bit of the internal carotid, and the ACOM and the PCOMs. They are the participants. Very important. MCA does not participate in the circle of Willis. MCA is nowhere in this. MCA goes out like this. It does not participate. Branches of the circle of Willis. I'm going to repeat all the same branches which I have mentioned so many times. Anterior medial central branches. These are the perforating branches which come from the ACA part. Posterior medial central branches coming from the PCA. What do these branches do? Why are you saying that this is breaking my heart? <laughs> they penetrate the brain substance through the respective perforated substances at right angles, and they are end arteries. They do not anastomose. The perforating arteries, they are anteromedial central, and the posterior medial central, they are central branches. They penetrate the brain substance at right angles to the anterior perforated substance and the posterior perforated substance. At right angles to the brain substance uh, surface and they do not anastomose in the depths. They are central branches. They are penetrating end arteries and their occlusions produce lacunar strokes. I hope everybody is absolutely clear about these. These are the branches which we have mentioned under the respective arteries. Now I'm talking them at them from the point of view of circular release. These same branches also form small aneurysms in hypertensive patients. Those are called microaneurysms or miliary aneurysms. And we will see, give them a name tomorrow. They are called Prusha aneurysms. And they can rupture. And they can produce intracerebral hemorrhage. So this is the significance of these perforating end arteries. What are they? They are anteromedial and the posteromedial central arteries. 
continuing with the circular valence. So this is the anterior circulation, this is the posterior circulation. In a normal patient, normal person, not patient, in a normal person, there is no intermixing of blood from the anterior to posterior and from the right to the left and vice versa. Each remains in its own territory. The vertebral basilla remains in its own side, the vertebral basilla of this side remains in its own side, the anterior internal carotid on this side, the internal carotid on this side, they remain in their own territories. So you can divide the whole two brains into four quadrants. This is the right upper, left upper, left lower, and right lower. They, are, they all remain in their own quadrants. Pressure of the anterior and the posterior become equal in the posterior communicating artery, and the blood flow stops there. They don't mix with each other. Pressure from the right and the left become equal in this acorn, and they stop there. So you're supposed to ask me, when do they mix? They mix only when there is an occlusion. Then one side takes over the other side. And the classical example of occlusion that we shall see tomorrow is subclavian steel syndrome, which I will not elaborate now. I'm going to reproduce the same picture tomorrow, and I'm going to go into it in more detail. So, but this just to show you by way of example, that the circle of will list is there only for our protection. Normally, blood does not mix in most people, 75% of the cases. They mix only when there is requirement, when there is an occlusion of this side or that side, or anterior, or posterior, or whatever. And that is the reason why we said that if there is an occlusion of the ACA before the ACOM, there will be no problems because blood will go from this side to this side. But if there is an occlusion of the ACA distal to the ACOM, there will be a problem. Clear? Now everybody has understood why. Likewise, if there is an occlusion of the PCA proximal to the PCOM, there will be no problem because blood will go from here to there. But on the other hand, if there is an occlusion of the PCA distal to the PCOM, this is the importance of knowing that A1 versus A2, P1 versus P2. Did everybody understand this? If there's any doubt, please tell me so that I can repeat this point. If there's an occlusion of P, P1 here, what will happen? Blood from here will flow and supply this. Yes or no? But if there's an occlusion of P2 here, there's nothing to supply blood here. <coughs> Likewise, if there's an occlusion of A1 here, blood will flow from here and supply the distal part. But if there's an occlusion of A2 here, there will be nothing to supply the blood there. Did we, did we get this point clear? So, occlusion of P1 and A1, no problems. Occlusion of A2 and P2, there is That is the importance of circular willis. So, important relationships of the circular willis, all summarized in this picture. I'm going to go into the details tomorrow. Look at the location of the circular willis, it's been enlarged in this picture here. It is located in the interpenetral system. It is related to the pituitary gland. It is related to the cavernous sinus. Because of the location of the internal carotid artery in relation to the optic chiasma, we have seen so many syndromes. It's lateral nasal hemianopia. Look at the relationship of the anterior communicating artery to the upper part of the optic chiasma. It will produce bitemporal or retinopia. Next, let me tell you something which I, will, which I mentioned to you in the beginning of this chapter. And I have enlarged that picture here. Can you see the ACOM here? And can you see a small branch in the region of the ACOM coming out from the ACA which actually runs backwards like this? We gave it a name. What did we call it? We call it the recurrent artery of Buchner. We also call it the distal medial striate artery. The importance of this small artery. This is a small branch which supplies the medial PFC and it supplies a little bit of the anterior part of the striatum. A column is the most common site of aneurysm. When we are trying to clip an aneurysm during surgery, as an iatrogenic problem, you may, not, not may, it has happened quite often. In fact, it is a well-documented entity. Because of the proximity of the recurrent artery of Huebner, this can also get clipped in our clipping. When we are putting a line that clip to the aneurysm, because it's arising very close, it can also be accidentally clipped. And if you clip one side, you will produce on the low side. Wow. And if you clip both sides, you will produce an extreme case of frontal lobe syndrome, which is known as akinetic neoplasm. But the person will become immobile and will not be able to speak. That is called akinetic neoplasm. 
So these can occur as an iatrogenic mechanism when we are trying to clip an aortic aneurysm. It's a small artery, but it happens. That is the significance. Now let's come to the next subchapter. A few words about the cerebral circulation physiology. This is where I'm going to answer something which you asked. In the cerebral circulation, there is very limited anastomosis. Very limited. Which are the sites of anastomosis? One. A little bit of anastomosis takes place on the surface of the corpus callosum in the posterior one. Between, I'm not putting the picture here because we have shown the picture already. Between the branches of the ACA and the branches of the PC. A little bit of anastomosis takes place on the posterior one. That is one place. The second place of anastomosis, as we have already seen just now, is the circular basic cell. But we have already carefully. What about anastomosis on the cortex and anastomosis in the brain, depths of the brain? Depths of the brain, there is no anastomosis. I think I have said it already 15 to 20 times. The breathing end branches are non anastomosis. So therefore, the story is over. The penetrating end branches do not anastomose, they are end arteries. What about the cortical surface, the cortical branches? On the cortical branches, on the gray matter, there is a very limited amount of anastomosis on the cortex. Little bit of anastomosis does take place between the cortical branches and the outer three to four millimeters. Does this answer your question? And tomorrow we will see an entity called ischemic penumbra. I won't elaborate on that now. That ischemic penumbra is nothing but after an attack of stroke, there will be a few cells on the periphery of the stroke which will be sublethally injured, which will not be totally dead. That is called ischemic penumbra. The ischemic penumbra is because of this limited amount of collateral circulation on the surface of the organs. So that is the only circulation, that's the only little bit of anastomosis that takes this very small amount of collateral on the surface. And so what is left? I talk about ischemic penumbra and all this. Yes, what is the anastomosis between the cortex? Between the various branches. Between the various branches. Between the least between the PCI and the PCI. Very little. Mostly between the branches of the same arteries. That's what brings us to the entity called the watershed infarcts and all those things. I'm going to talk about it. But just know that the limited amount of anastomosis takes place in the cortex. Circulation of the gray matter is much more than the circulation of the white matter because other neurons which are going to have metabolism. And the clinical significance of this is that when you do a PET scan, and I have shown you several PET scans, what have you noticed? You have noticed that the areas with the greater metabolism appear red and yellow, while those areas with lower degree of metabolism, they are more violet or blue in color. So that PET scan is the best indicator of the metabolism or the circulation. Cortex has got a much higher circulation and metabolism. That brings me to what are the factors which aid the cerebral circulation and what are the factors which inhibit cerebral circulation this is important. Factors which aid the cerebral circulation is the most important is the systemic arterial blood pressure. And the factors which inhibit cerebral circulation is the cerebral vascular diameter or other constriction of the cerebral circulation and intra-arterial pressure. And of course, viscosity of the blood, we will not go about that. So let's take these three entities one by one. Systemic blood pressure, cerebral vascular diameter, and intracranial pressure. Let's take them and go a little bit into detail. Systemic blood pressure. This is the main propulsive force which determines the circulation to the brain. That is the reason why you have something called SYNCO. And I told you some examples of SYNCO when we did the autonomic nervous system. One was vasovagal attack. Parasympathetic mediated brain bradycardia in the case of low sympathetic vasogastric. When a person gets a shocking news or something, suddenly there is vasodilatation, sudden drop of blood pressure, not enough pressure to supply blood to the brain, the person collapses. That is one example of acute vasovagal attack. Another example of syncope is chronic orthostatic postural hypotension. A person sitting or lying suddenly gets up, there is venous pooling, decreased venous return to the heart. Decreased cardiac output, drop in blood pressure, less cerebral perfusion, person drops down. So therefore, the most important in this regard, cerebral circulation is 
the propulsive mechanism is provided by the systemic arterial blood pressure. Within certain limits, if there is a systemic fall in the blood pressure, like for example, a normal person, a healthy young man, or any person, when you're lying down, if you suddenly get up, you don't get close to an ambulance. But it happens in old people. That's why old people are told that when you get up from the bed, don't immediately stand up. You lie down, get up, put legs down for some time, wait for a few seconds or minutes, and then slowly stand up and catch catch or something to make sure. So that you give time for the systemic sympathetic tone to pick up. Because I have seen old people falling, they get up on the bed and slam their finger and I've seen people getting injured in the head and all. So what happens in a young person? Why doesn't a young person fall? Because of this mechanism. Well, the systemic blood pressure falls for any reason, for short, within limits. In most people, as a reflex mechanism, the systemic vascular, the cerebral vascular resistance also decreases. So that with the low blood pressure also, the cerebral circulation is maintained. So this is an important compensatory mechanism which takes place in young people. Let's come to the role of cerebral vascular diameter. It's very easy to understand. If the cerebral vessel restriction is there, there will be less cerebral perfusion and vice versa. So what are the determinants of cerebral vascular diameter? Let's take the most unimportant one first. Sympathetic tone. In the case of cerebral circulation, sympathetic vessel restriction, it does not play a major role. That's why I just mentioned it in the beginning. Finish it up. The most important determinant of the cerebral vascular diameter is the pH and the ionic concentration, specifically hydrogen ion concentration of the CSF, pH, and PCO2. Increased PCO2 and increased hydrogen ion concentration produces cerebral vasodilatation. Must know. And I'm going to give you the clinical use of this point just now. Increased hydrogen ion concentration, increased PCO2. Increased PO2 is a cerebral vasodilatation. And this point is used in clinical situations. For example, when we get cases patients presenting with head injuries or after cerebral strokes or brain tumors with increased intracranial pressure, what do we do? We put them in artificial ventilation, intermittent post ventilation. And by means of that artificial ventilation, it is called mechanical ventilation, the word is IPPV, intermittent positive pressure ventilation. We actually regulate their PCO2 level. We control their PCO2 level to keep it at this level, between 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury, 4 to 4.7 kilopascals. Because at this level of PCO2, the cerebral vessels are in the right diameter to provide cerebral perfusion. So this is our aim when we put a patient on artificial ventilation after head injury or any in case of intracranial pressure. Because PCO2 is a very important determinant of cerebral circulation, PCO2 and hygiene and concentration. And likewise, increased PO2 uh, is a cerebral vasoconstrictor. What is the role of central primary receptors? They do not have any direct role on the circulation. They play a role on the stimulation of the respiratory system. And the central chemo receptors, which are located in the medulla mostly, there are many of them, the nucleus factors of the as well, for example. What do they do? They respond to CSF, pH, PCO2, and arterial PCO2, but not arterial PO2. The central chemo receptors do not have PO2 receptors. They are the main driving force to respiration at sea level atmospheric pressure under normal circumstances. But they do not have any direct bearing on circulation, but they control the respiration. That brings me to the role of intracranial pressure. The third one. Yes. I just have a question. For, for putting the patient and control the CO2, is the main reason to control the ventilation? Yes. If you keep the CO2 at this level, the cerebral vascular diameter is right for perfusion. If it is below this level, the cerebral vascular vessel restriction will take place. And if it is more than this level, too much of vasodilatation will take place, and that also is not good. Yes. Even with the increased PO2? 
Yes, PCO2 is the main determinant, right. I told you. PCO2 is the CSFP, PCO2 is a more important determinant than PCO2. So it is pH, H hydrogen ion concentration, pH are opposite, of course. The pH ion concentration and it is PCO2 are the most important determinants. Just remember that. What about the role of intracranial pressure? Intracranial pressure, it actually hinders circulation. But yesterday I told you the normal intracranial pressure is around 10 millimeters of mercury. That is 150 millimeters of water. So obviously, the mean arterial pressure, that is the difference between the average between the systolic and the diastolic, is much about this to maintain circulation. Now let's take a situation where the intracranial pressure rises above the mean arterial. That will again produce the next component. Increased systemic blood pressure will activate the carotid sinus and aortic arch reflex and will decrease the heart rate. And finally, because of compression on the brain stem respiratory centers, respiratory rate will also become irregular or slow and so on by our respiration and you get Cushing's prior. So this is the full mechanism how Cushing's reflex works and how Cushing's this is the role of intra intracranial pressure on cerebral circulation and respiration. Methods of determining cerebral blood flow. When I talk of cerebral blood flow, I mean microcirculation. fMRI and PET scan, these are all indirect methods of determining cerebral blood flow. For example, if you ask the patient to focus on a particular object and look at something, you can detect increased cerebral blood flow in the hospital. You ask the patient to Think of something, you find more blood flow in the frontal region, and so on and so forth. But those are give, they just give us a semi-quantitative method. Suppose you want to quant get an accurate quantitative estimation of the cerebral blood flow. How do we do it? We do it by means of radio isotopic studies. And the two isotopes which I use for this purpose are radio isotope xenon gas which is inhaled or radioisotope krypton which is injected intracarotid. And in either case, you record the decay of radioactivity from the brain by means of a beaver tower. And the rate of decay gives you an estimation of the blood flow of the brain. And by this method, this is the normal blood flow of the brain. This is milliliters per gram of brain tissue per minute. This is how the blood flow is happening. So we have finished with the essence of the arterial supply of the brain, the structures, the words about the cerebral circulation, determinants of cerebral physiology, and the methods of determining cerebral blood. Now let's come to a few quick words about the venous system of the brain and then the spinal cord arteries. Many of these veins we have already dealt with in our in our Menji's chapter. So I'm going to go through the quickly, but only the ones which we have not dealt, I'll talk about them. The brains of the brain can be divided into superficial and deep, or external and internal, both being the same. So let's quickly take the superficial or the external veins. Veins drain the frontal and the parietal regions. They are called the superior cerebral veins. And we have seen all these veins, yes or no? 
These superior central veins, there are about eight or ten of them on either side. They all drain by means of the bridging veins. I have already told you in great detail what the bridging veins are. You should know that by now. They drain by means of these bridging veins into the superior cerebral sinus. There is one big vein which joins the superior with the superficial middle cerebral vein, which is another the superior anastomotic vein. Good. The veins from the inferior part of the cortex, the temporal region, they all drain to the transverse sinus. And again, there is one big anastomotic vein, which is called the inferior anastomotic vein. Okay. This vein that you see here on the surface of the lateral fissure of Sylvius, on the surface, please note that, I'm repeating the word surface. That is called the superficial middle segment, because it's on the surface of the vein. Where does this one drain? This connects these veins, and at the same time, it also drains into the platinum sinus. Superior sagittal sinus and the cavernous sinus are the two most important neurovenous sinuses, which drains the entire sup sup supralateral and infralateral surface of the vein. The other sinuses that we studied that day all drain the deeper parts of the vein. Let's see what the deep circulation is. The deep circulation, the deep venous system. The deep venous system also refers to the internal or deep cerebral veins. Let's take them one by one. Keep the arteries in mind. We have seen anterior cerebral artery, we have seen the middle cerebral artery. So with that, this is an inferior surface of the brain. This side, the temporal lobe has been removed to see from the inferior surface. This side, the full temporal lobe is there, you can see it. Take a look at this artery here. You should be able to recognize this artery. This is the this is the MCA. Come on, the internal carotid is dividing into MC. MC, I told you, goes laterally through the lateral fissure of Sylvius. Yes or no? And this is the ACA. By now, you should be able to identify the MCA and the ACA. I want you to identify and be able to clearly locate the location of this. So, accompanying the MCA, there is another vein here. That is the deep middle cerebral vein. Why deep middle? Because there is already a superficial middle cerebral vein, which I mentioned just two minutes ago. This is running in the depths of the lateral fissure, that's why it's called the deep middle cerebral vein, which accompanies the middle cerebral artery. Accompanying the ACA is a vein, which is called the anterior cerebral vein. It does not require much of a brainer to understand that. So the deep middle cerebral vein, anterior cerebral vein, and there's a vein which is not shown here, which drains the corpus spinatum. That is called the spinatum. These three veins unite to form this major vein which runs around the cerebral pedunculate, roughly parallel to the PCA. Remember PCA also runs around the cerebral pedunculate. So these three veins, which is the third one is not shown here, they unite to form the basal vein. Basal vein. Why is it called the basal vein? Because it runs around the basis pedunculate of the cerebral These two basal veins, from either side, they unite behind the midbrain to form the gray cerebral vein of Galen. <coughs> they unite, they all drain into the, they don't unite, they, they drain into the gray cerebral vein of Galen. They drain into the gray cerebral vein of Galen. So this is one set of deep veins. Deep in the cerebral vein and just cerebral vein. Now let's take the other set of veins. This is a little complicated, but we'll make it simple. Let me get this picture here, and let me get this one. Take a look at this picture and follow the text there, because this is the best way I can keep it simple. This is again a surface of the brain with the superficial structures removed completely to show you only the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricles, the roof of the third ventricle, the tentorium cerebelli. First, get orientation. Take a look at these veins which are coming from the striatum. This, these are known as the thalamostriate veins, and there are veins which are draining the choroid plexus. They are called the choroid veins. So this is draining the thalam thalamus and the striatum, and this is draining the choroid plexus. Both of them unite in the region of the interventricular foramen of Monroe to form the internal cerebral veins. So. Same thing here, thalamus striate vein, from the thalamus and the corpus striatum and the choroidal veins uniting in the region of the interventricular foramen of Monroe to form the internal cerebral veins. 
So one internal cerebral vein on this side of the midline, one intercerebral vein on this side of the midline. Both these run from anterior to posterior, anterior to posterior on the roof of the third ventricle. <laughs> and I did mention that they run on the roof of the third ventricle through a structure. And they run through the hila covidea which has been removed from here. They run like this, and at the region of the pulvinar of the thalamus, they unite to form the great cerebral vein of spaghetti. In the region of the sclerium and the pulvinar of the thalamus, the great cerebral vein of Galen, within the great cerebral vein. So they unite to form the great cerebral vein of Galen. And this is the vein which received the two basal veins. The great cerebral vein of Galen then unites with the inferior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, which all of us have studied. And this union occurs in the falco-tentorial junction. And this union occurs in the falco-tentorial junction, and this, and this is one of the falco-tentorial confluence. And it forms the straight sinus. And the straight sinus then continues at the left transverse sinus. We have all seen this in our other chapter. So this is how the deep cerebral vein and the great cerebral vein of Galen is formed and how it creates into the That's why I told you in the beginning of this section that the superior sagittal sinus and the cavernous sinuses drain the superficial parts of the brain and the other sinuses drain the deeper parts of the brain. The deeper parts of the brain are formed by these veins. Please take a good look at the internal cerebral veins, how it forms the great cerebral vein of Galen, and also take a good look at how the basal veins drain into the great cerebral vein of Galen. And finally, do not forget how the great cerebral vein of Galen unites with the ISS to form the straight sinus. It then continues at the left transverse sinus. So this is the simplest way to understand the human brain. The rest, this is good to look at the picture. Do not memorize what is written there. This base of the posterior brain is also they all drain into these veins. Now let's come to the last part of this chapter and we are done. That is circulation of the spinal cord. We did touch upon it in the beginning of this class. When I was talking about the vertebral artery, I told you the vertebral artery gives us to the first two branches, the PCA and the, the posterior spinal artery and the anterior spinal artery. Let's go a little deeper into that. The PSA and the ASA. The two PSAs and the one ASA. Contrary to what we may think, they are not very big arteries. Please get this point very clear. And they are not sufficient to supply blood to the entire length of the spinal cord. Therefore, the blood supply of the spinal cord is classified under two broad headings. One is the longitudinal group of arteries, which we have just now named. The two PSAs, one is. I'm going to go into that before it is. First, get the understanding. And the second set of branches, arteries which supply the are called are known as the segmental arteries. What do they mean by segmental arteries? Segmental arteries means at every segment of the spinal cord, a series of arteries will enter from both the sides. These a abet and enhance the circulation of the posterior arteries. Therefore, spinal cord has the two sets of muscles A series of longitudinal arteries and a series of segmental arteries. First get this point straight. Now, the segmental arteries that we have seen here, they are again further subdivided into two broad subgroups. A set of these segmental arteries are called just radicular arteries. What does the word radicular mean? It supplies only the spinal nerve root regions. That's why the word radicular, radicular means roots. And there are another set of segmental arteries which are bigger. And they supply a little more of the spinal cord. They are referred to as segmental medullary arteries. So with this background, let's go deeper and take them one by one. The posterior spinal arteries. We have already seen it comes out from the vertebral artery. 
each side remains separate, it runs in relation to the dorsal root of the spinal cord and runs down. What is posterior spinal artery? It supplies only the posterior one for the spinal cord. This posterior spinal artery is not a very major artery. And it is especially deficient from the segments T1 to T3. Therefore, in these segments, it requires reinforcement of the arteries which I told you just a little while back. The segmental, medullary, and the ventricular arteries. From this, it follows that if due to any reason there is an injury to the posterior spinal artery in the region from T1 to T4, especially, and if the segmental arteries in this region are not strong enough, the patient is more likely to have ischemia, the posterior spinal artery syndrome in T1 to T3 regions. This is the most important point to be understood. This is the region of supply. And T1 to T4 segments of ESA syndrome are more common. Now let's take the anterior spinal artery. The anterior spinal artery again arises from the vertebral arteries and both the sides unite and they run down in the anterior median fissure of the spinal cord. They do not run there, it runs in the anterior median fissure, embedded in the pia major. All these arteries, they run in the pia major. As it runs down the length of the spinal cord, it gives rise to branches through the anterior median fissure which supplies, and these branches are known as the sulcal arteries. And through these sulcal arteries, it supplies the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. What does it mean? It supplies the both anterior commissure, anterior white matter, most of the lateral white matter, anterior brain horn, the, cent the, the periaqueductal, not periaqueductal, the posterior, the brain commissure, and the basal of the dorsal brain horns. It just does not supply the posterior cuniculus of the spinal cord. Here again, there's a catch. The posterior spinal and anterior spinal artery is again deficient in T4 segment and L1 segment. And it requires reinforcement of these segmental arteries. And if the segmental arteries in this region are not sufficiently strong, then you can get ASA syndrome which is more common in T4 and L1 segments. Finally, the anterior spinal artery also gives branches to the medial part of the medulla. And we have already seen that these branches are known as the paramedian medullary branches. So if these anterior spinal arteries are occluded in the medial part of the medulla, they can also produce medial medullary cells. <coughs> I have not written it here, but it is mentioned in another section of the chapter. Now let's take the next set of arteries, the segmental arteries. I told you the segmental arteries can be subdivided into two groups, the radicular, the smaller ones, and the segmental medullary, the larger ones. Let's take the radicular first and take a look at the same picture. These radicular arteries, they arise from big named arteries in each segment of the human body. So in the cervical region, they arise from the ascending cervical and deep cervical branches of the vertebral arteries. And they go to each segment of the vertebral column. In the thoracic region, they arise from the posterior intercostal arteries, which are branches of the thoracic cavity. And they enter into the spinal cord to each intervertebral foramen. In the lumbar region, they arise from the lumbar arteries, which arise from the abdominal aorta, and they enter to each. And in the sacral region, they arise from the lateral sacral artery, which is the branch of the internal artery. So at every segment of the spinal cord, they arise from different different named arteries: the ascending deep cervical. The posterior intercostal, the lumbar arteries, the lateral sacral arteries. And every segment, they enter through the intervertebral foramen. As you can see here, they enter through the intervertebral foramen, they divide into a posterior root, an anterior division, and they supply the region of the roots of the spinal cords. Important point to be carried over. 
these radicular arteries are not very big arteries. They supply only the region of the spinal nerve roots and a little bit of the spinal cord here. And these radicular arteries, they do not, I repeat, they do not anastomose with the spinal artery, anterior and posterior. You can see they are not anastomose. This is an important point to be noted now. The radicular arteries do not anastomose with the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. They just add to the cells blood supply, but they do not anastomose. Because I'm going to say something different just after this. Coming to this next group of segmental arteries, the larger ones. And we gave them a name. We call them segmental medullary arteries. How do those segmental medullary arteries go? They also arise in the same way. They also arise from the cervical region, ascending deep cervical, thoracic region, posterior intercostal, lumbar region, lumbar arteries, segmental region, and the same They also arise in the same way. They also enter in the same way. They enter through the intervertebral foramen. They also divide the same way, the posterior anterior division. They also divide the same way. You can see in both these pictures. But there are some important differences from the right. First, they are much bigger compared to the radicular. Can you see? They are much bigger. They supply a larger part of the spinal cord. And please take a very good hard look at this picture. And this picture. They anastomose with the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. So not only do they supply a larger part of the spinal cord, they also anastomose with the anterior posterior spinal arteries, and so therefore they enhance the supply of the anterior spinal arteries. The spinal arteries. That is why I told you a little while back the anterior and the posterior spinal arteries are not sufficient by themselves. They need reinforcement for these segmental medullary arteries. Segmental medullary arteries anastomose with the anterior and posterior spinal arteries and they help to enhance the circulation. That is why I told you again and let me repeat, if the segmental medullary arteries are deficient in, in, deficient in T1 to T4 segment, then you can get posterior spinal occlusion syndrome and if they are deficient in T4 and L1 segment, you can get anterior spinal artery occlusion syndrome. Finally, one more point remains. We are just almost near the end, just two more slides and we are done. These radical segmental medullary arteries and the radicular arteries, they are both not present in the same segment. If one segment has got a radicular artery, it will not have a segmental medullary artery. And if this a particular segment has a segmental medullary, it will not have a radicular. So both segmental medullary and radicular are not present together in the same segment. Either one or the other will be present, but not both. So therefore, they are irregularly and alternately arranged. They're not both present in the same segment. Final point, there is one particular segmental medullary artery which is a very big one. It is a grand one. And that has been given a separate name for the great anterior segmental medullary artery. Adam Key is This is a very big segmental medullary artery which is usually present on the left side, in the lower thoracolumbar region. And it is such a big artery that in most people, it supplies the spinal cord between the cervical and the lumbosacral artery. That means it has got so much of blood supply, blood supply. and in some people, it can even be the main source of blood supply is the lower two parts of the spinal cord. That means it becomes even more important than the spinal artery themselves. That's called the great segmental medullary artery. So these are the facts about the, the spinal cord circuit. ASA, PSA, radicular arteries, segmental medullary arteries, and the great system. Finally, the spinal cord venous remains. Yes. Is that the one I can use to paraplegia? Yes. Tomorrow. And I'm going to mention that. Yes. 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 Nothing special to mention about them except a few salient points. All the venous veins of the spinal cord, they drain into three sets of veins anteriorly and three sets of veins posteriorly. Three veins anteriorly, three veins posteriorly, vice versa. Three anterior, three posterior. So there are six 
longitudinal spinal veins. All of them, longitudinal spinal veins, they drain into the plexus of veins which I've been saying repeatedly and hammering my head. They all drain into the internal vertebral venous plexus. I have reproduced this picture here and this picture here so that all of you are clear in your mind where is this internal vertebral venous plexus located. This is the internal vertebral venous plexus located around the spine for in the extra dual space of the vertebral canal. Can you see the fatty material here, the yellow fatty material? And embedded within these veins, these are the veins. So these longitudinal spinal veins, they drain into the internal vertebral venous plexus. Next, the internal vertebral venous plexus of anterior and the posterior, they all drain out through the intervertebral veins. They come out to each intervertebral foramen. Then they communicate with the external vertebral venous plexus. And from there, they drain into each segmental region of the human body. So it is not over yet. You know it. This internal vertebral venous plexus continues up and communicates with the dural venous sinuses. Principally, two dural venous sinuses. Who will name those two sinuses for me? One is the inferior intracell sinus, and the other is the oxygen sinus. And the same internal vertebral venous plexus shown here, here, and here can be the root of spread of abdominal pelvic cancers, the dural venous sinuses. So this is the venous drainage of the spinal cord. Tomorrow we have to start with the clinical correlations. We will start not straight away with the clinical correlations. First, we will start with the pathophysiology of cerebral circulation, uh, pathophysiology of strokes, where we will go into a little bit of other topics, like how thrombosis occurs, how arteriosclerosis occurs, how, and then we will go into stroke, then we will go into all the manifestations of stroke, and then we will see aneurysms. We will not finish tomorrow, we will continue until Monday. Okay. So this is here.